Hi, we're Mike and Beck from Voyage, and we're so glad you've joined us for our online service. A big hello to our church family who are gathered in Voyage at home locations, and a warm welcome to everyone else, wherever you're joining us from. Hey, maybe there's someone that could be encouraged by this service, so why don't you share or send the service link to someone right now and invite them to join you. During the service, we usually share communion together. It's a special way we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. If you're a first time guest, maybe even new to Christianity, don't let communion freak you out. In fact, we're so glad you've joined us and we wanna to get to know you better. Give us a wave online or jump on over to voyage.church forward slash hello and let us know you're here and we'll make sure to connect with you. Now, before we start the service, we're going to take a few minutes so you can get ready. If you haven't yet prepared communion, you can do that now by getting a piece of bread or cracker and a glass of grape juice. Or you can take this time to get a Bible, turn off distractions and pray to prepare your heart and mind for the service. Today, we start a new message series called Love Each Other. This series is not about loving your cousin, your boss, your neighbor, not even your pet or your enemies. Even though Jesus did teach on most of these things, this won't be about that. This series, Love Each Other, is specifically about disciples of Jesus, loving disciples of Jesus who are in your local church. If you're a part of Voyage, could you close your eyes just for the next few moments 
and think about the people who are in Voyage. And if you're in a, in a different local church, just close your eyes, recall their faces because with COVID, maybe it's been a while since you've all gathered together in full. And now get their faces in your mind because this series, Love Each Other, it's going to be about these people. And if you bear the name Christian, who believes and trusts in Jesus Christ, and this is about you loving other believers in the church where you belong in increasing measure. Okay, you can open your eyes. See, you might think that you know what love is and you might think you are already loving. But do you really and are you really and is it increasing in measure? Is there more room in your heart to learn about love and to grow in love? Now, for those who have joined us and you're not part of a local church, or maybe you don't even consider yourself as someone who believes or trusts in Jesus, don't tune out because this series will be relevant for you if you want to know what love is. You see, the world, your work colleagues, your family and friends, they probably all define love in so many different ways, which is subjective and confusing, and it actually makes conversations about love difficult at times. Well, we pray and we hope that through this new series, Love Each Other, that you will discover and begin the voyage of personally experiencing the love of God who died and rose again to take away your sins and who is the only one with the ability to heal and transform your heart, giving you the desire and the power to love. In fact, I pray that the love of God would increase in all of our hearts during this series, transforming and strengthening the local church for God's glory and for our blessing. So before we begin, if you're able, I invite you now to stand, join with me, lift your hands in worship and lift your voices in song as we sing together to our great God, the blessing. Oh 
whose favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor and a thousand generations And your family And your children And their children And their children May his favor be upon you And a thousand generations And your family And your children And their children And their children May his presence go before you And beyond you And beside you
Oh, that song, The Blessing, it's, it's one of my favourite songs, I think, for this year. Um, isn't it good to worship the Lord? I want to invite you to turn to your Bibles in John chapter 13. And I'm reading today from the New Living Translation. Have your Bible ready to open because I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'd love for you to follow along. Maybe you've got a pen. Maybe you'd like to write some things that really speak to you as we're reading it through together. So get that ready now. Well, love each other. Here we go. On the 27th of June, 2013, the then President of the United States of America, Barack Obama tweeted, hashtag love is love. His actual post on Twitter read like this, retweet if you believe everyone should be able to marry the person they love, hashtag love is love. His tweet was in regards to same-sex marriage being legalized in America. So on that basis, he tweeted, hashtag love is love. So if love is love, then why can't a person marry their dog or their cat or their car if they really love, love them? Like if hashtag love is love, after all, who are you to tell them what love is or what love isn't? Now, my goal isn't to discuss today the issue of marriage or the morality of same-sex marriage, but rather the message is about love and the definition of love. And I've used Barack Obama's tweet as a springboard to talk about love and for us to see just how subjective and abstract love has become. Because what's really clear in the world today is just how unclear the definition of love is. There seems to be so many meanings to love, so many ideas that are clouded in selfishness, fear and even guilt. With the expectation that all definitions are acceptable if it's your own truth. But can this be true? Can love really be whatever you want it to be. Some, things, some people think it's loving to give your kids every material possession that you can afford and every opportunity that you can create. I mean, consider the US college admission scandal last year with wealthy parents conspiring to get their kids into elite colleges through bribery and cheating. I mean, how long have they been behaving poorly in the name of love to give their kids whatever they can, however they can. I mean, just look where that kind of love has led them. I'd say down a really dark path, which actually isn't loving at all, but they probably claim it's love. Sure, they might have overstepped the line, but they would probably still hold fast to the motivation of love. And then there are some siblings through fear, through guilt, well, they think it's loving to just keep bailing out over and over and over their drug addicted siblings. Um, and yet others, well, they, they say, no, they're going to face the consequence of their choices. Even if there's a threat that that may endanger them, like that they might do something really bad. And they believe that's the most loving thing that they could do. And, and some people think it's loving to tell the truth, no matter how much it might hurt someone with others believing, no, 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 it's more loving not to speak up, just keep things hidden and keep the peace. You see, the examples are endless. And if you think about love, love is now a universal term for nothing in particular, which makes conversations about it difficult. I mean, what does hashtag love is love even really mean? With the world divided and blinded in defining a love that is sure, trustworthy, unchanging, able to stand the test of time and able to communicate into any culture and any era, well, who can define this kind of love? And let's read now from John chapter 13. 
where we hear the words of Jesus. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, well then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. Verse 12. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master. Nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. I'm not saying these things to all of you. I know the ones I've chosen, but this fulfills the scripture that says, the one who eats my food has turned against me. I tell you this beforehand so that when it happens, you will believe that I am the Messiah. I tell you the truth, anyone who welcomes my messenger is welcoming me. And anyone who welcomes me is welcoming the Father who sent me. Verse 21. Now Jesus was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Oh, the disciples looked at each other wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. And Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who's he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it's the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Jesus was, oh, sorry, since Judas was their treasurer, some thought Jesus was telling him to go and pay for the food or give some money to the poor. So Judas left at once, going out into the night. Verse 31. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, The time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will soon give glory to the Son. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, you can't go with me now, but you will follow me later. But why can't I come now, Lord? He asked, I'm ready to die for you. Jesus answered, die for me? I tell you the truth, Peter, before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny 
three times that you even know me. I'm just going to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Oh Lord, we come around your word. We, we come under your word. We come to learn from you. Holy Spirit, open our hearts. Open our minds to what it is that you're saying to us. Help us to grasp who you are this day in increasing measure. In your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, this, this account that I just read, it was an important night for Jesus and his disciples. We now know this evening as the Last Supper. And its significance will be actually in the events of the next three days. It was the last meal Jesus had with his disciples just before he faced the agony of the cross. And it is Jesus who is troubled in spirit. Yet even on this night, we see Jesus' love for his followers. When of all times it would have been appropriate for the disciples to encourage him and support him. We discover that they can only see their own loss. Therefore, Jesus encourages them, serves them, teaches them and prays for them. On the night that Jesus was to taste death on their behalf, Jesus demonstrates his love. Jesus has the authority to command love from his followers because well, Jesus practices what he preaches and he expects his followers to give only what they have received. Our key text for this new series that we're starting now called Love Each Other is John 13, 34 to 35. And it would do us well to memorize this verse over the coming weeks while we're in this series. It's only two short verses. Jesus said, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And Jesus again repeats this during the same night found in chapter 15 verse 12. He said, this is my commandment. Love each other. In the same way, I have loved you. You know, Jesus said, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Yet this commandment, it's actually an old one. But it was about to take on a whole new meaning. And for us to appreciate the significance of this, we have to know what, what this actually meant to the Jewish disciples, this command. Firstly, hearing and adhering to God's commandments was nothing new to them. And if you know anything about Jewish history and Jewish culture, God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments and many more, totaling 613, around 15 BC, around 1500 years before this Last Supper. And he gave these commands through the prophet and leader Moses. And none of these commands have changed up until now. All the commands known as laws were recorded in the Jewish book called the Torah, which is actually the first five books of the Bible. In the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Now, as young children, these Jewish disciples, these boys, they would have memorized large portions of the Torah. So to hear Jesus give a new commandment, which was to love each other, well, this actually would have been puzzling. They would have been thinking, well, what's so new about that? I mean, this is an old commandment and a very important one. In fact, in Jesus' ministry on the earth, he'd actually said how important this was. Recorded in the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament, chapter 12, Jesus was asked by an expert in Jewish law. So he was really savvy. He was across the law inside and out. Okay, it's probably like going to a Queen's Council or um, a justice, like someone, you know, top in the law, in the law of Moses. And he asked this question, which law or which command 
is the most important of all of them, like of 613. And I actually reckon this is a really good question because, oh my goodness, I don't think I could memorize all of those laws. All right, so I'd want to know too, well, out of all of them, like what's the most important? And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. That's amazing. Out of 613 laws, Jesus boils it all down to these two. By fulfilling these two commands, you would fulfill the 613 commands. And he quotes from the well-known Shema. Shema. And it's from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 19. Now, so well known is the Shema among Jewish people that it actually helped to locate displaced Jewish children um, in Europe after World War II in 1945. Rabbi Eliezer, or Eliezer, I don't know how to say his name, I'll just say Eliezer. Uh, Eliezer Silva, uh, he had a promising lead with a report that a monastery in southern France had taken in Jewish children. But the priest was of little help when he got there, declaring to his knowledge that all the children were Christian and Rabbi Silva could produce no records. And these children, they all had German surnames, so they could actually be Jewish or Gentile. Now, the term Gentile just means, you know, anyone that's not Jewish. Like they could have been European. And he scanned their many small faces. Many had lived in this monastery since they were toddlers. How could he know if they were from Jewish families? So in front of the children, he began singing in Hebrew the Shema. A handful of faces lit up and tiny voices from around the room joined in. They recognized these ancient words from their bedtime prayers and from their earliest memories of hearing their mothers and fathers recite them each morning and evening. This is the most beautiful story that came out of such atrocity. So this commandment, to love each other. Oh, this was old. This, this Shema, it was old and it was well known for centuries. Passed down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation. That's what actually saved these children and, and brought them back to their families. So what was new about it? When Jesus said, I'm giving you a new command. Well, nothing was new about, if, about it if Jesus, if, sorry, if Jesus had stopped right there. Right? But what was revolutionary was what he said next. He said, love each other just as I have loved you. Oh, this is new. You see, Jesus inserts this phrase, just as I have loved you, into the old commandment from Leviticus. The new part is that Jesus' disciples are to love each other, not the way that, you know, they want to be loved, which is a little bit subjective, right? But now they are to love each other the way Jesus loved them. Then everyone will know. You see, the indic indicator of a Christian is the way we love each other. This command, well, it's like new wine, freshly made. This is a whole new standard of loving. We are to love each other 
just as Jesus loved us. The twin commands of loving God and loving your neighbor have been known since the days of Moses. But what's new is the standard of loving. Jesus demonstrates his love for his disciples by serving them and laying down his life for them. It is the kind of love Jesus has for his father and now extends to embrace the whole human race. What kind of love is this? Love each other just as I have loved you. These six words, just as I have loved you, is where Jesus gives the universal definition of love for all people, for every race, culture group, and for every generation. This love is not shifting or obscure, subjective or biased. It has no fear and no guilt. Jesus, who is God, came down from heaven to earth to make God's love known to you and to bring you peace with God. Jesus not only speaks about love, but he demonstrates it. When we look to Jesus, love is clearly seen. We look to Jesus to know love, a love that is truthful and humble, generous, extravagant, undeserved, faithful, enduring, patient and sacrificial. This night alone we see Jesus taking on the role of a servant in washing the disciples' filthy feet. Jesus sitting at the same table and loving the one who was about to betray him. And Jesus assuring his love to Peter and the rest of the disciples, knowing that they were soon to reject him in his greatest hour. And during the coming days, the greatest love the world will ever see would be displayed on a torturous Roman cross for all of us to know. God himself embraces the agony of death on a bloody cross for the sins of the world. Jesus becomes the propitiation for our sins. Why? Because God is love and God loves sinners. And it's so difficult for us to understand the significance of the cross when we don't understand what it all means. You know, we see crosses around people's necks, but what does it really mean? We see crosses on the top of buildings. We see crosses in art and and the symbol is everywhere and it's become, you know, just kind of normal to see a cross. But what does it really mean? Well, the Bible tells us that everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's standard of holiness. You see, you, my friend, were created to be in a loving, close relationship with God. But you've sinned against him. The definition of sin is rejecting God and rebelling against him, pushing him away, wanting to be ruler and master of your own life, telling God to shove off. And the Bible tells us that everyone has done this. And in doing this, we are eternally lost and dead in our sin. Now, the word propitiation, the ESV Bible says that God is love. In 1 John, I think it is chapter 4, verse 9, it says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Other translations use the word atonement or sacrifice or that Jesus has come to take away our sins instead of that Jesus has become our propitiation. But these other words, while they make a little bit more sense to us because we're not familiar with propitiation, they're just not strong enough to to communicate 
the incredible work that Jesus did on the cross for the world's sin and for your sin. The original Greek word, I'll try and pronounce it, I've got to say it now, halasimos, I think that's it, halasimos, that you Greek scholars, correct me later, it means propitiation. Propitiation of an angry God. A sin offering by which the wrath of God, which is anger, the wrath of God will be appeased or satisfied. I mean, this is scary to, to come before an angry God. And, and didn't we just read from the Bible in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love? That's how I started. God is love? Absolutely. And God is just and God is holy. And it's this very reason that God is love, just and holy, that he must deal with sin. Otherwise, he is not loving, not just and not holy. God hates sin because it destroys the sinner. Now, the word propitiation is not a word that we meet every day. It's not a very popular word these days either. But it is one of the essential concepts of the gospel, the message of Jesus, to describe and explain the death of Christ. It's a word associated with sacrifice, with atonement, with anger and judgment, being dealt with in some way so that a relationship could be restored. It's an idea that we're familiar with enough in everyday life, in fact. For example, if you crash into my car, then chances are I'm going to be angry about it, especially if you're being really stupid, especially if you're on the phone texting, okay? I'm not going to have much mercy for you. I'm going to be angry about it because you're being stupid. And I'm going to demand some sort of satisfaction, like more than, sorry, oh, <laughs> sorry, no. You see, if you cover the damage that you did, and not only cover the damage that you did, but you cover the inconvenience. Maybe you hired a car and gave me that hire car so that I had a car to get to work to while mine was getting fixed. And maybe you bought me some flowers and took me out for dinner, okay? You made payment. Well, then my anger, well, then it should be turned aside and dealt with and we can be friends again. That's propitiation. It's dealing with or turning aside the anger, the anger of God toward us in order for our relationship to be restored back to God. You see, our rejecting God has offended him, our sin, and he is rightly angry about our sin, rejecting and pushing him away. And it's up to God to say what would satisfy him, like what would restore the relationship by turning that anger aside. You see, the problem is there's nothing that we can do to satisfy God and to turn aside his anger. Even our very, very bestest, bestest efforts of goodness are like filthy rags. And even when we try, guess what? We're going to fail because we just can't be good all the time. But at the cross, oh, it's at the cross that God, he is more than satisfied by paying the penalty for us on our behalf through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. And he turns aside from his anger. You could say that it was death by love. In God's love. He paid the full cost out of his own pocket. You see, God was actually taking the punishment of your sin upon himself because it was God, Jesus, the son who died on that cross. And the father forsakes Jesus on that cross and he pours his anger and his judgment 
out upon him for the sins of the entire world. That's why Jesus cried out in that moment on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, this was the only time in all of eternity that the father and son were going to be separated because God could not look upon sin. He couldn't be in the same place as sin. When Jesus became sin's sacrifice, he was judged, he was punished, and he was separated from the presence of God. And he did it for you. He did it for me. Why? Because of his great love so that you could be fully forgiven, so that you could have your sins dealt with forever, never to be judged because Jesus was judged in your place on that cross so that when you believe in him, you would be restored into a right, loving and peaceful relationship with God. Christ died for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the sinless for the sinner to bring you to God. Let me sum it up by reading this passage from the Bible in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fail. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. Oh, now people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and included them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Woohoo! Isn't that amazing? There's nothing that you can do except one good work. And that's to believe in what God has done for you through Jesus Christ. Because God is love. Love takes on a whole new meaning and power because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hashtag love is not love. Hashtag God is love. God is the one who defines love. A love that is clear, generous, I would say extravagant, faithful and true. A love that is gracious, so undeserved. What did we do? All we did, what did we contribute? All we did was sin and reject God and go our own way. But God, who is great in mercy and in love, came down from heaven through his son Jesus to show us who God is and what God has done to bring us back to love. What is love? John 13, 34. Just as I have loved you you should love each other. This series, Love Each Other, well, it can only happen as we experience the love of Jesus in our own hearts. You see, we cannot give someone something that we don't already possess. And by the power of God's Spirit, when you receive and accept and believe in Jesus, He comes into your heart and fills you with his love. So I invite you today, right now, to believe in the work and person of Jesus Christ. Don't leave it another day. Come and believe and receive 
And would you follow me in a simple prayer? And I invite all believers to join with me in thanking God in this prayer for what he has done. So if you'd repeat after me and bow your head and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, I know I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life. I'm guilty of rejecting you and ignoring you. But thank you for loving me so much that you sent your son to die for me so that I may be forgiven. And I believe that Jesus, you rose from the dead to give me new life. Please forgive me. And with your help, change me. So that I live with Jesus as my new ruler and my saviour. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, I just pray for everyone who prayed that prayer by faith, that your spirit, Lord, would come into their hearts and assure them that they are made right and righteous in the work of Jesus Christ. And now they are accepted as your beloved son and daughter. Thank you, Jesus. Make this real to them. In your name I pray. Amen. You know, just as we're in this place of prayer, of consideration, of remembrance and thanksgiving about what Jesus has done, let's hold our communion emblems. I'm just going to get mine here and maybe yours is ready in the on the table and just hold your emblems and if you're able to, would you stand with me in worship, ready to partake as I pray on our behalf? Because these emblems represent Christ's body who suffered on the cross and Christ's blood that was shed to wash away our sin. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what kind of love is this? We hold these emblems remembering with thanksgiving in our heart. What kind of grace is this? Making us who are sinners right in your sight. Sending Jesus to free us from the penalty of sin and from the stronghold of sin. Bringing us into a relationship of love with you. Oh, thank you, Jesus that you went to the cross willingly because you love the Father and you love us. And we believe in the work that you have done, that you have made propitiation on our behalf and that this work is complete, that this work is finished, it is final. And now we accept, we believe, we receive, we enjoy, we bless, we praise, we love, we thank. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. And we thank you, Holy Spirit. And I pray that your love would increase in our hearts, that we would get a fresh revelation, that we would return back to our first love and that this would translate into love for each other. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us partake together. Thank you, Jesus. And let us worship in song. Amen. Here in 
this moment when heaven breaks through. I want to stay here forever with you. I am surrounded and I just want to worship. It's all I reject God and keep trying to run life your own way, but you'll have to live with the messy consequences of your decision and now face the terrible future of an eternity of separation from Him, without love or relationship, or you can turn to God by living in Jesus' death and resurrection and see everything change. For a start, God wipes your slate clean. He accepts Jesus' death as payment for your sins and freely and completely forgives you. He pours his own spirit into your heart and grants you a new life that stretches past death and into forever. You're no longer living against God, but you're now welcomed in as a part of God's own family, his adopted son or daughter. Don't delay. Contact us from the details on screen. Start living with Jesus as your ruler and discover this is how life was truly meant to be lived with the one who made you and loves you completely. We want to take this time to personally thank everyone who financially supports the work of Voyage. Your regular partnership ensures the ongoing health and strength of Voyage 
Even with COVID-19, we're undeterred. We're sharp in conviction, clear in direction, and eager to see everyone in voyage fulfill what Jesus said to his church. Love God with all your heart, love people as Jesus loved you, and make disciples. Thank you for believing in us and all that God still wants to do through us together. To financially partner with us in this great faith adventure, you can give in three ways. By cash at any of our Voyage at Home locations, via the bank details on the screen, or go to voyage.church forward slash give. And again, thank you so much for continuing to graciously give for God's praise and glory. We hope you've been encouraged by our online service, but it doesn't have to end here. V groups are small gatherings who meet during the week at different times and locations to learn the way of Jesus together. And Voyage Youth Group meets on Friday nights. Plus, if you'd like to join a Voyage at Home location on a Sunday, jump on over to voyage.church forward slash hello, and we'll be sure to help you with any inquiries you have. In closing, we want to speak a blessing over your life. It's found in the Bible in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. Let's read this aloud together. I I pray pray that that God, the source source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Spirit.